I don't know if you can read this uh, title to our sermon up here. It's called The Hypostatic Union. In fact, I'm glad today that we are a bunch of wordsmiths and we like to do crossword puzzles. We like words because that's what we're going to be doing today. I learned two new words this week. And they say that if you repeat a word ten times, it's going to be yours. So <laughs> these two words are doozies. And, you know, they're sure to show up in a crossword puzzle. Or uh, maybe you could play Scrabble and win, for sure. Or uh, words with friends. So, you know, uh, crossword puzzles, they always start out with a definition first, right? So I'm going to give you a definition. Ready? Here's the definition. The doctrine of the hypostatic union of the divine and human natures in the single person of Christ. And you all know what that word is, right? No. <laughs> if you saw that definition in a crossword puzzle, it would have to come from the New York Times, right? The word is theanthropism. <laughs> so when you see the Latin roots there, you see theo. You know what that means? It means God, right? And anthro, you know what that means? Human, right? And ism means it's a doctrine. So we put all those together. And you have the doctrine of God and human. So hypostatic union of the divine and human natures in the single person of Christ. Interesting word. Theanthropism. The key word in that definition is hypostatic. And uh, the Latin roots here are a little more obscure. Hypo means under, and static means standing, unmoving, lying, or to establish. And so the definition of hypostatic is underlying, like the sediment in a liquid that goes to the bottom, you know, or the basis for all reality, or that spirit and physical are fundamentally joined together hypostatic. You got it? Now, wasn't that fun? <laughs> so why am I boggling your brains over these two gigantic vocab words? Well, it's because I discovered they're essential to our faith. Who knew? You can't believe without these two words. <laughs> Theanthropism means there's a real union between God and humans, and it happened in Jesus. He is the hypostatic union. He is fundamentally both God and human in the same person. You see why that's so important to us? Today we'll see how Jesus uses theanthropism to stop his opponents in their tracks. He doesn't actually use the word, but you'll see. He challenges them with an argument they can't refute. He's doing this over and over. No wonder they get mad at him. Jesus would have made this awesome lawyer because he, he comes up with these arguments nobody can refute. Okay, you know two new words now. So use them. Feel free to use them to impress your friends. <laughs> you... Use hypostatic in, in like every other word you say to your friends, and won't they be impressed? Well, we're going to find out what all this has to do with our passage today. But starting with 31, then, of chapter 10. Again, the Jews picked up rocks to stone him. And Jesus replied, I have shown you many good works from the Father. Which of these works are you stoning me for? We aren't stoning you for a good work, Jews answered, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Well, isn't it written in your scripture, I said you are gods? If he called those whom the word of the Lord came to gods, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say you are blaspheming to the one the Father has set apart and sent into the world because I said I am the Son of God? If I'm not doing my father's works, don't believe me. But if I am doing them, and you don't believe me, believe the works. 
This way you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. And then they were trying again to seize him, but he eluded their grasp. So he departed again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing earlier, and he remained there. Many came to him and said, John never did a sign, but everything John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. Okay, so the religious leaders have surrounded Jesus in a threatening manner. They've carried rocks with them because they planned to stone him. I don't know, did they have a, a load of wheelbarrows with rocks? I don't know. The word means carried. They carried rocks with them. I love how Jesus reacts to these guys. You know, a lot of people want to run away, right, or tried to duck or something. He just stands there and asks them the legal basis for their stoning him. Talk about a nervy guy. He knew it was time to die, of course. It wasn't time to die. That was coming up in the spring. He knew it wasn't now. So he wasn't really afraid even, I don't think. So what does he ask him? He's incredulous. I've shown you many good works. Which one of these are you stoning me for? The, trans the word translated good there is a beautiful Greek word. It means beautiful. It means lovely. It means like noble morally wonderful works that he's been doing. And so he's, he's, what are you stoning me for? Look what I've been doing amongst you. So he's reminding them of all the times he's healed people. They don't seem to care about him. Remember the guy who was born blind and he healed him and all they wanted to do is throw him out of the temple? Yeah, but he's reminding them of these things. And because Jesus is that kind of guy, even though they've got rocks in their hands to stone him, he's giving him one last chance to understand, to believe and have eternal life. The scene is almost comical. It's almost like a Monty Python sketch. I love how Tissot, this artist, shows Jesus' expression. He's, sli he's slightly smiling as he waves ta-ta and he's leaving them. He's so in charge, Jesus is, and his question stops him cold. It's like, it's like they look at each other confused. Uh, well, uh, we aren't stoning you for something good. That would be unthinkable, right? Uh, we're, uh, we're stoning you for uh, 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 blasphemy. Yeah, blasphemy, that's the ticket. That's what we're stoning you for, blasphemy. Of course, they just wanted to get rid of him. You're making yourself God. That's why we're stoning you. The problem was that isn't in the Old Testament. That isn't in the law. They made that up. It's like they had thought of it on the spot or something. The Old Testament said blasphemy was cursing God. Jesus is not going to curse God. He isn't cursing God. All right, so let's look into Jesus' defense just a little bit. He, he argues the way rabbis argue. Like any rabbi, Jesus first directs their attention to the scriptures, a scripture passage. In verse 34, he says, Isn't it written in your scriptures, I said you are gods? Now, where did he get that from? Well, there's at least three places in the Old Testament where God says something like this. He uh, talked to Moses. He said that Moses would be like God when he spoke through Aaron. He'd tell Aaron what to do, and it would be like God. Then in Exodus 4, 22 to 23, God calls Israel his son. He says, then you will say to Pharaoh, this is what Yahweh says, Israel is my firstborn son. I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me, but you refused to let him go. But the actual place that Jesus is quoting is from the Psalms. It's Psalms 82, 6. And here God's talking to the rulers of Israel, the judges, they're called. He says, I said you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. That's God talking to humans, right? You are all gods. Jesus' point was, if God called humans his son in their Bible, in their scriptures, why couldn't he also claim to be God's son? He's an Israelite, isn't he? We see this in our next verse, in our text in John 10.35. If he called those whom the word of God came to, which is the Israelites, if he called them gods, and the scripture cannot be broken, 
Do you say you're blaspheming to the one the Father set apart and sent into the world because he said, I am the Son of God? So they themselves, even back in John 8, said much the same thing as Jesus has been saying. He said, they say, we have one Father, God. They're calling themselves sons of God, themselves. So Jesus is pointing out to them that they're being inconsistent. If they stone him, they ought to stone each other. Now, what does he mean? So he's kind of refuted that one totally. They got nothing to come back with. But what does he mean when he says that he was set apart and sent into the world? He's claiming two things there. First, he says that God consecrated him, set him apart for a special task. He means that he's set apart just like they were. The Pharisees thought that they were set apart, the rulers of Israel. The Sabbath was set apart. The priests are set apart. The temple is set apart from normal buildings. The people of Israel were set apart from all the other nations, according to the Old Testament. And like that, then, God set Jesus apart from other humans, Jesus is saying. He's consecrated for a task God wants him to do. And second, he claimed that he didn't decide to do these works on his own. It wasn't his idea. God sent him. The Father sent him. Jesus used the same word as when you send a messenger or an ambassador or something, that word sent. What the religious rulers then were seeing was Jesus just being obedient to the task he was given to do. How is that worthy of stoning, Jesus is saying. Now, to the readers of John's gospel, we see a whole different thing going on here. There's another level for the readers. Because remember, John is placing this during the festival of dedication when the temple is dedicated, after Maccabees uh, conquered um, and rebuilt the temple and rededicated it after the Antiochus Epiphanes had desecrated it. So, John is saying at this level that his readers understand that Jesus now is the new temple being dedicated, being consecrated. And in some sense, Jesus is the new Israel where all the promises to Israel have been fulfilled. Now, let's see why Jesus says, and the scripture cannot be broken. What does he mean by that? The commentators had to, had to list this long of all kinds of things that people think that means. It, it really just, the way Jesus is using it, just means that the Bible doesn't lie. That's what he's saying. So if it calls humans sons of God, then why are they going to stone him if he agrees with their scripture, calling himself a son of God? Well, of course, the readers, again, know something. They know that Jesus is talking about a really a, a different meaning than what it sounds like. He's talking that he's not just one of the Israelites. He is the unique one, the son of God, the only son of God. The readers of John know this. So when they're reading this, they're hearing that level as well. And I really think that Jesus' opponents, these religious rulers, suspect that's what he's saying. And that's why they have rocks in their hands. And then, because it's obvious they didn't believe him, Jesus has to refer him to his works. That's in verse 37. If I'm not doing my father's works, don't believe me. But if I am doing them, and you don't believe me, believe the works. This way you will know and understand that the father is in me and I in the father. So in the face of unbelief of these guys, Jesus is reminding them of the many good works they've seen him do. He's pointing to them, telling them, that the Father was doing them. It wasn't Jesus' power. He's saying, it's not my power, it's the Father working through me. So that's an indication to you of who I am and what's going on here. If they could just acknowledge that the Father was at work, the power behind Jesus' works, then they were well on their way to believing who Jesus is and to having life. And they could believe his words because they started to believe his works. They could believe that he's the Messiah, the unique Son of God. And so there we are at our two big vocab words. Theanthropism means 
that there can be a real union between God and humans, and it happened in Jesus. He is the hypostatic union. He is the fundamental. He is fundamentally both God and human in the same person. He's telling them that's what they have to believe. If they have seen the good works the Father's doing through him. Wouldn't happen otherwise. The works demonstrate that Jesus and the Father are one, the hypostatic union. I'm loving this word. Okay, let's get a broader picture of this. The quote that Jesus used demonstrates basic truth of really the whole Bible. The basic truth of the whole Bible is that there's a covenant between God and humans. He's not out there somewhere. We can know him. That's the covenant. God has made it possible for humans to have a personal relationship with him. Our lives, this is the whole message of the Bible, our lives can be a hypostatic union with the Father. But that sounds like we're little gods, right? That's not what it's saying. No, it's saying that we are temples of the life of God within us. Our lives can also be fundamentally based on the life of God. So then, because God is eternal, so are we. Because our lives are fundamentally based on him. We are a hypostatic union with the Father. We live in Christ, and our lives are hidden with him, it says. I think my brain is going to explode. <laughs> this is so big and so wonderful, and it explains stuff that I've been wondering for a while. It's funny how when you get a label on something, you feel like you know it. But at least I got me a label anyway. And it's no wonder Jesus is trying so hard to convince these people. He wants to give them the life of God too. But they have to first believe his works came from the Father. So he concludes, this way you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. They have to believe in the hypostatic union of Jesus and the Father. Yeah, well, that didn't go so good, did it? <laughs> they're like, oh, they're just right over their heads. And so at least now they're trying to grab him. They, they put down their rocks. Now they're trying to arrest him. Some of the commentators say they want to take him outside someplace and beat him down, but he, he, just, he just slips away. Jesus is so slippery in John. They keep trying to grab him, and he just goes, pew. Okay, now we come to one of the saddest statements in John. Verse 40 starts out, so he departed again. He's done this before. Left him. Remember, he took off, went to the Samaritan woman, so on. This is the last time that Jesus will attempt to teach these religious leaders. They have no other opportunity to believe. They have refused they blew it. That's it for them. Jesus has left the building. It's tragic. Incredibly tragic. They have the scriptures. They pour over the scriptures. They revere the scriptures. Jesus says, you look for the life in them, and them standing right in front of you. Unending study. And it was fulfilled before their very eyes. And they refused to see it. Clear as a bell. They didn't want to see it. They were focused on keeping their positions. They were focused on their own pleasures, being adored by the people, considered holy religious people. They wanted to keep all this. They wanted to keep their pet ideas of who this Messiah was supposed to be. So they refused to believe who Jesus was. 
They blinded their own eyes. As hard as Jesus tried to get through to them, and he tried hard, couldn't do it. They would not accept the evidence before their very eyes. And there are many today in that same boat. It's incredibly tragic. Some simply refuse to believe the Bible. Some don't like the doctrine of God's judgment. They only want his love. So they want to reject all the judgment part. Some so twist it around that it becomes a fiction they have invented to replace it. I've been reading a book like that. There's a couple of them. It seems to be a thing right now. People reinventing our religion. These people today, they're just as blind as these religious rulers were. And I'm afraid they're going to share the same fate. Jesus has left the building. I'm afraid their church is like that. Fortunately, there were many, many more in Israel who accepted Jesus. So John finishes chapter 10 on a happy note. 42, and many believed in him there. And many believe him here and today. So then the question comes down to which group are you in? Are you with those religious rulers who decided to disbelieve, who refused to accept the clear evidence before them? Is that the group you're in? Or are you with those who believe because of what they've heard about Jesus? Back then, they heard from John. He was the witness, and we've heard from many. Which group are you in? What do you believe about Jesus? So far in John, we've learned that he's the bread of life. We've learned that he's the water of life. We've heard that he is the light of life. And next, we'll see that Jesus gives life when he raises Lazarus. Do you believe it? Do you believe that you too can be in a hypostatic union with the Father? Do you believe your life can be fundamentally joined with God so that your life is based on his life, giving you eternal life? Do you believe that? It's big. Your hypostatic union with the Father can be true. Amen. Okay. So they said if you use a word 10 times, it's yours. I used it at least 12 times. So maybe I can remember it. It seems to be the most important word in the dictionary, so I want to remember it. Okay, one more time now. You say it with me. Ready? Hypostatic union. Okay, you said it once, so you got to use it 10 times today. And you notice it makes a cross. How cool is that? 